All right, so um, I'll, I'll just start by saying a few words quickly before handing over to Jim and Alex then. Um, for those of you that don't know who I am, uh, my name is Barry Cranford. I'm one of the founders of the, uh, the London Java community. Um, so I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a developer myself. Uh, I am, in fact, a recruiter. Um, or I run a, a tech recruitment company called, called RecWorks. Um, so our, our work is all around uh, trying to find ways to make recruitment into a power of good in the tech industry. Um, and the LJC is, a, is an example of that. So we, we first founded it way back in 2007. That's what's that, about 13, 13 years ago now. Um, and we've organized over 600 events. Uh, we also run um, a small uh, thing called Meet a Mentor, another smaller community called Meet a Mentor which is a free mentor introduction service uh, with over 2000 introductions. Um, so just like ev everything that we do, it's, it's all very much a kind of a collaborative effort. Um, so we, uh, we're, we're always impressed with so, so many people that are prepared to, to, to give up their time um, within the tech community, um, just, just completely for free, just to try and help each other and, and, and for everyone for the benefit of the industry. And which is, which is really what, what tonight's all about. Um, so we've got Jim Goff, who's been, who's been involved in the LJC for over 10 years, I think now, Jim. Um, speaking to Alex yeah. Blewett, who, um, yeah, I, again, I can't, I can't remember so, so long that you've been involved in the events um, tonight. Anyway, about uh, CPU and microarchitecture. Um, so anyway, with that, I'll hand over to, to Jim. Thanks, everyone, for logging on and uh, hope you enjoy the, the, the rest of this evening. Cool, thanks Barry. So I'll just take a couple of minutes to introduce uh, Alex. Um, I've known Alex for quite a long time as well. So Alex uh, started working on Java since its first release. Um, and I think you've worked on quite a few projects in the JVM space at, at Goldman and Credit Suisse, which is where um, I first met Alex. Um, I, I always remember my first experience with a code review, like a proper code review was with Alex. Um, I think I had to make about 30 changes before it was approved, but you know, these are good learning experiences. Um, uh, so yeah, that was really fun. Um, Alex has also done a JCP repre representative as well uh, during his time at Credit Suisse. Uh, and during that time also when we were out in the Docklands, founded the Docklands LJC. Uh, which is which is still a pretty cool community, and hopefully once uh, once things settle down a bit, we'll be able to get that going as well. Uh, so Alex has been working on Apple, uh, sorry, on Swift to Apple as well, um, and now he's at Santander as well as doing things like uh, writing about Java for InfoQ, uh, chairing the recent uh, sort of QCon event as well. So um, the other thing I, I'd like to do is uh, so we're going to try and take Q and A towards the end of the session. Um, so if you want to ask, there's a and A button at the bottom. Um, of the slide. So feel free to ask things as we go along. And if there's stuff that's kind of relevant, I'll jump in and interrupt Alex as we go. But in general, we'll, we'll try and take questions at the end. So cool, Alex, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Jim. And I'm assuming if you need me to speak up or speak down, then you'll let me know as we go as well. So um, this presentation is one that I put together for QCon that went, ran a couple of months ago, just before everything shut down. But because not everyone was able to come and see it, I thought I'd do this again for the LJC. And I've updated some of the slides since then as well, because uh, some new software has been released. But the idea of this is really to find out what goes on inside the CPU and how CPU intensive programs that are reported as being 100% busy can actually be made to go faster by taking advantage of the parallelism that's built inside the process as well. We'll look at some tools to be able to help measure where those performance benchmarks are, and we'll see what we can do to be able to make programs execute faster. So in the scope of being able to describe where the performance applications actually fit, there's what I like to call the performance pyramid. So if you've got things that are dealing with memory layout or instructions or CPU architecture, those are right up to the top. And you should only really tackle those if you've identified and fixed all of the bottlenecks beneath them. So typically when you're building large scale distributed systems, your choice of how your distributed architecture is fit together or how the system architecture is gonna have a much bigger impact on things than the low level code itself. What we're gonna be talking about is really the top part of this thing, how you can write programs uh, to be more optimal when they run on CPUs. And of course, there's a bunch of other talks that are available on InfoQ if you want to be able to find out about that. So one of the things that happens inside a CPU these days is you have what's called a non-uniform memory architecture. And almost all server-side PCs have this non-uniform part. What it means is that in your system, your processors talk to, instead of one 
amorphous blob of memory banks. They're actually partitioned. So there are some memory chips that are nearer to one processor than the other. That's the non-uniform part of it. And these can be deployed in two, four, uh, eight combinations. So mo modern systems run with a serious amount of complexity under the covers. But each one of these processes or dies actually has a bunch of cores on it. And we've seen the move away from Moore's law to be how you're running parallel programs. And the parallelism is really an increase of the number of cores that you have on these dies. So a Broadwell core, which was the previous generation, a 12th core looks like this, where you have a bi-directional ring of data to communicate between them. And they went with an 18 and a 24 core die as well. In the 18 and 24 core dies, you actually have two rings that are being able to move data backwards and forwards, and you have a bi-directional pump of data. So if you have some program that's executing on one of those cores, even if it might be on the same die, there's almost like a mini networking delay being able to transfer data from one part of the die to the other one. And for Cascade and Skylake, they modified it so that it would be a mesh-based architecture instead, so that if you wanted to get from one place to another, that you'd be able to take multiple routes in order to be able to get there. But if you want to get from one side to the other, you still have the delays of being able to get across that barrier. In Skylake, they shipped with a 10-core die, they had an 18-core, and they had a 28-core as well. And on the 28-core die, you can actually partition your die into two sub numa clusters. So what this would allow you to have is if you were building an application or set of applications and you wanted to partition them in space, you could say you want some set of applications to run on the left-hand side of the die and some applications to run on the right-hand side of the die. And then the left and the right-hand sides here would then have their own dedicated memory banks so they wouldn't trample on each other. Now, they also had a 56-core die. Actually, it's a package because what they did is they put two dies next to each other and then hooked up a fast interconnect between the two things. But in order to understand how processing works, we need to have a look at the memory hierarchy. And the memory hierarchy is represented as a different levels of caches. They use the dollar symbol because it's a pun on the word cache. Um, registers, the register file that exists inside a modern core can store up to 180 integers or 168 floating point values. And accessing these register values takes about uh, one clock cycle. And so depending on how fast you're running your clock, that's going to be a different number of nanoseconds. I prefer thinking in terms of clock cycles because uh, the speed of the core may change over time and you may have different speed cores anyway. Um, those delegate back to a level one cache. The level one cache in most modern CPU architectures is split into a data side and an instruction side. The reason why we've got these two sides is because you don't want the program flow to be interrupted because you're loading a lot of data and you're evicting instructions from the cache. And the other advantage is that the level one instruction cache is typically read only because unless you're running something with a JIT on board, you're not overwriting or generating instructions on the fly. The level one data cache uh, and level one instruction cache take about four cycles to be able to read. And on Skylake uh, Cascade systems, you have about 32K on each side. I think on Skylake, there's 48K on a level one data side. So that's growing slightly, but they haven't really grown that much over the last few generations. If you can't find data inside the level one cache, it delegates to a level two cache. And the level two cache is much bigger. Uh, it has one megabytes worth of data that can be used to serve content from either the level one cache or the level two cache. One interesting point about reading from data is if you read something that's missing and it's not in the level one cache, then it takes uh, some time to go from the level two cache into the level one cache. And then once it's there, some more time to go from that level one cache to the registers that you're using. So you can have ad additive delays in being able to load memory that's not, that doesn't fit inside cache. And what you'll find is you can write programs that work very quickly from a micro benchmark point of view in a tool like something like JMH. And you can show that it works really fast because the data set that you're working on fits inside the level one or level two caches. But as soon as the data set grows beyond that size, then it starts to slow down because you then have to fall back to the level three cache. And the level three cache on Intel systems is shared across the back end cores. So if you have a 16 core system, you'll have 16 slices of the level three cache that all of the cores will share. Previously, the level three cache used to be something that was specific and inclusive, which means that if the data was in level one, then it would also be in level three as well. Now, the level three cache is non-inclusive and it's just a part of the memory system. And when there are cache coherency traffic caused by loading data from a level three cache on a, die, on a um, core somewhere else, then because the signals have to 
cross across the package or the die to be able to get there, then the speed of access of this memory can be varied depending on where it comes from. And each one of these level three caches has got its own backing RAM stores, which can be anywhere from say 150 to 300 cycles. Actually measuring speed of RAM is a little bit different because you're not solely constrained by the memory cycles of the processor itself. You also have to depend on whether you're using ECC RAM, whether you're being able to pull things over DDR3 or DDR4, or indeed the upcoming DDR5. If you want to know how the system works on your application, you can use a program called LS Topo. And LS Topo will give you an overview of how the memory hierarchy fits in with your system. It can also show the IO stuff, which we're not showing inside here. I ran this on my laptop before QCon, and it was running on a single package, single socket system. Uh, it has um, a number of different cache levels, one through three. And in fact, it shows the level four cache on my particular laptop, because there's a level four cache which is reported, and that's just shared memory between the GPU and the CPU for optimizing of the video drivers. I've got four cores that are running underneath there, and they've got hyperthreads enabled. Uh, hyperthreads allow you to take advantage of stalls and other pipeline holes in the runtime to make it look like you're running two threads at once. One of the problems with enabling hyperthreads is that you end up with contention on the register file and the data traffic going out to the L1. So when you enable hyperthreads, you double your virtual CPU count, but maybe you impact negatively the level one data cache. And we've seen the recent attacks on things like Spectre and Meltdown, which are caused by information leakage when a hyperthread runs on a sibling core to the one you're running on. It wouldn't surprise me if in a few years time we see hyperthreads not being enabled or even sold for server class systems, because I think we're moving away from hyperthreads as a technology generally. But going back to our memory cache, there's not, these aren't the only caches that exist inside a processor. Another one is the TLB or translation look aside buffer. What the translation look aside buffer does is it caches the lookup between virtual and physical pages. So every physical memory location on your system has got a physical address which says where it actually is. But it's pointed to by a virtual address for the purposes of the programs that you're running. And those virtual addresses need to be looked up by the program all the time and therefore the lookup of virtual addresses and the translation into physical needs to be as fast as possible. Translation look aside buffer is the thing that effectively is a hash map between virtual page and physical page. So not a single memory address, but a set of memory addresses that are next to each other. And these pages are stored in a process using the CR3 register pointing to the page table directory. And the page table directory is like a tree. I've shown here two levels of a tree, but there's four levels on most ordinary uh, systems, although Isolate will be able to support five uh, processes, uh, five level pages to give a, a bigger virtual memory space. And those pages can either be specific to the process, they can be shared between processes, they can be mapped in the same space like the kernel uh, content, or if you're enabling something like uh, KTPI, the uh, kernel handlers to switch back into the kernel mode. But every time a processor switches from one process to another, it switches out the CR3 and so points to a different page table and that can cause memory flashes in there. The other thing about these page tables is that this is how processors have been working since virtual memory first started in the Intel systems. And these page sizes default to 4K. Now 4K is an incredibly small amount of memory. This slide alone would not fit in a um, single page of, of memory, for example. In order to be able to fit more data inside there, there is something called huge pages. And what huge pages are is essentially something which is bigger than a 4K. Various different processors from various different manufacturers will support different sizes of huge pages. But most Intel systems will support two megabyte support or one gigabyte support. And there's a couple of POC info flags that you can find out what the supported flavors are for your system. The advantage of using a huge page is that you have a smaller page table structure because instead of needing to map every 4K, you can now map every two megabytes or every one gigabytes worth of space. And if you're running, for example, Java applications with multi-gig heaps, then you know you're using that much memory anyway, so why not make it available to your system? Um, huge pages themselves aren't something that you'd be able to create directly um, uh, and, and use and know that it's going to be more efficient because there are some gotchas about it. One of them is the fact that the default implementation for huge tables on Linux was something called huge table FS. And the huge table FS said, 
at boot time, you're going to guess how many huge pages that you want. So your, some part of your system is in huge pages, part of it is in the small size. And you then need to have a special file system mounted and then only root can access that. As a result of which, almost no one uses huge table FS anymore. And it wouldn't surprise me if sometime that goes away. You can have what's called transparent huge pages. Transparent huge pages are a benefit because they don't require any boot time or configuration or special permissions. So you can run something that takes advantage of transparent huge pages without needing a lot of setup or support from your boot architecture. The way that it works is that there's a background daemon called khuge paged. And what that does is it takes a whole bunch of smaller 4K pages and merges them contiguously into form one one megabyte or uh, two megabyte or one gigabyte size. So the default page size is still 4K, so that when you run programs that haven't been written to take advantage of it, you can be able to fit that in together. But processes can optionally enable to say, hey, I'd like to create huge pages here through the use of something called mAdvise. And there's a number of applications that use mAdvise in order to be able to take advantage. In the JVM, if you enable large page support, then it will use mAdvise to be able to set up its heap as well. Um, if you are doing that, it can sometimes make sense to pre-touch the memory as well. There's an option in the JVM to always pre-touch, uh, which will then run through and set up all of your page structures. You do get a bunch of benefits of um, having smaller TLBs, particularly when it comes to process switching, because there's much less to swap in and swap out of the page table structure, and therefore you get better utilization of the TLB cache. In order to use transparent huge pages, you can echo mAdvise to the following configuration line. You can also set it up in uh, the syscall boot or uh, however you set your boot variables up. There's also an option that you can use to specify for defrag. And the defrag option is something which will, in the background, try and assemble these large pages for you on demand. So it'll try to be a bit forward looking and maybe have one or two large pages in spare for the next application that needs them. But if there aren't any large pages at the time the application requests it, there are a number of configuration options that it can do. One of them is it can block your application until a large page is available. And that's the default if you have enabled and the defrag option. Uh, it can also just give you back a 4K page size, which might be suitable, or it might do a combination of the above. The best one to put on is to use something called defer. And what defer will do is it will say, if you have a large page size, great, give, it, give, give that back. If you don't have a large page size now, give me a 4K page instead. And so you don't get any blocking delay if you use defer for being able to do that. That was a relatively recent addition to the Linux kernel. So depending on which version of Linux kernel you're running, you might find that you don't have that option in there. If you're dealing with anything that is particularly pause sensitive, then defer is probably the best option to go for. Now, the next thing that we need to talk about loading memory is how cache lines and data loads work. Because when you read and write a byte in a program, you might think of it programmatically as just reading and writing a byte. But in actual fact, memory comes into and out of the memory subsystem a cache line at a time. Cache line at the moment is 64 bytes. So when you read a single byte in your program, you're actually causing 64 bytes to be able to be read in. You can take advantage of this if you design data structures appropriately, because it means if you know you're pulling in one cache line's worth of data, you can maybe structure the size of your data elements to be able to fit in that space. If you're loading uh, data with cache lines, though, you should probably not depend on the fact that it's 64. There's a runtime flag that will tell you what the cache line size is, but at some point, the cache line size is going to double to 128. And I don't think we're too many years away from where that happens. The cache lines themselves are held in the processor and they can be flagged with different states, whether it's read, effectively a read-only copy of it, whether it's modified, whether it's owned but not modified, or whether it's uh, an empty slot inside there. And there's various different profile, there's very different combinations of the messy protocol that will allow that cache lines to work. One other thing the memory system does for you though, is it notices when you're striding through applications. So if you're reading through memory in a continuous fashion, then the memory subsystem will bring in additional cache lines for you to make them available on demand. So linear processing through large amounts of data can be really fast and you can amortize the cost of loading that data without really noticing that there's a delay inside there. It also works if you're striding through on a particular known offset. So if you have an array of elements and you're stepping through them, then the memory subsystem will recognize that and be able to pull in the appropriate cache lines. It may be that you're reading and writing every 256 bytes, for example, so you only need every other cache line or every few cache lines to be brought in.
There is a compile time option called built-in free prefetch that you can use if you think you are writing a program that would take advantage of being able to load data inside there. However, I would suggest caution for being able to use this because although it will generate the necessary instructions under the covers, if you bring in memory too early, or conversely, you bring it in too late, then you're wasting performance without gaining any actual benefit. So if you are going to start investigating that, you should really have the benchmarks to prove that this is going to take be a benefit for your particular application. One other thing that is visible at program levels due to the way cache lines work is something called false sharing. If you have two threads that are hammering either end of a cache line to being able to read and write data inside there, what will happen under the covers is that cache line will be ping-ponged between the two cores that are trying to write values inside there. And it takes a while, as we saw at the beginning, because of the architecture of the way multiple cores are connected to each other, to be able to punt this cache line from one state to another. So if you do have two threads that are heavily contended and writing on the same place, then you can see a performance degradation of that process. The way to avoid that is simply to pad out your thread data structures so that you don't have two threads reading and writing the same cache line. And in fact, the general advice is to pad at least two cache lines worth of size because although the memory is tracked at the level of one cache line, the load fill buffer that punts data from one level of cache to another typically does so on a pair of cache lines or a load fill at any one time. And in any case, if the cache line increases in the future, then it's something to be aware of. There was a SunMisk contended in prior versions of Java. Now it's a JVM JDK internal contended instead. And that contended flag is something which will automatically in your class pad out data structures one side or another. And if you look at the Java util thread class, you'll see some examples of where that's used. So we talked about how the memory cache structure works and how the CPU pumps data around. How can we use that for our advantage when we're writing programs? Well, Clearly, if you've got data that fits into the level one cache, it's going to run faster than if you have a program that only fits into the level two cache or the level three cache. So be aware of the sizes of the caches on your system and try and match it to the data loads that you're going to be able to use. If you have a sharding infrastructure, maybe consider how you split up your shards to be able to take advantage of that to process data faster. Stream through data, preferably forwards in a, a linear direction or with a constant skip inside there, and then you will be able to take advantage of the memory prefetch system and consider your data structure arrangement so it may be more efficient to have an array of structs or instead of a struct of arrays or the equivalent in the java basis and we talked lastly about the multi-threaded writes and being able to specify be able to space out contended writes on there um, one option which is also useful is to compress data where possible. So if you compress data and then extract it on the fly, it may seem like you're doing more work, but actually if that compression of data means that there's less data to punt up through the different caches and then you're just doing all of the decompression in a tight loop in the processor itself, you may find that you get a better performance. And that's one of the reasons why using compressed pointers in Java can give benefit to your application because not only is the pointer half the size, but that really means you can get more data into your caches and therefore more performance out of your application. You can also consider pinning the memory and threads. So if you want to make sure that you built a system that's processing data accordingly, you can try and make one set of data processed by one thread on one core and another set of data processed by another thread on another core. This will then reduce inter-memory core ownership traffic, uh, you're less likely to have cache invalidations inside there, and you'll be able to take better cache locality for the level one and level two caches on the cores that you see. Some ways of doing that include using ISOL CPU to be able to create some non-kernel CPUs. Um, so what will happen is the kernel will schedule its work across all of the cores on your system. If you have a particular high uh, performance or low latency requirement, you can carve off part of the CPUs for specific application uses. You can use task set to allow you to bind specific uh, processes or threads to specific cores. And so if you're writing something like a multi-threaded Netty server, where the goal of the Netty server is to be able to have one thread per core, then you can actually use pinning to make sure those threads aren't moved off cores and therefore lose their uh, lo data locality that's been stored in the caches. And then if you're dealing with really large memory systems, you can take advantage of the way that the non-uniform memory architecture is structured by using NUMA control as a command line program to set it up afterwards, or your program can call into libnuma for being able to do specific affinity settings for programmatic use. Alex, so, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. There's a question that's come in that I think is probably best answered now. Uh, 
Um, and the question is, at what point or in what scenarios would you worry about setting the flags for padding structures um, and that kind of thing? And what kind of speed ups and impacts are you seeing based on those like, particular use cases? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that if you were designing a data structure where you had multiple threads updating, say, a flags register to say whether that flag, whether that thread had been completed or not, then if you just have an array of booleans indexed by thread ID, and those threads are then writing into those boolean arrays to say, yes, this thread is done, or no, this thread isn't done, then you'll find that they will be contended. And it's difficult to give a specific number of how much it's going to impact, but you could imagine an order of magnitude um, maybe a couple of orders of magnitude, depending on how many threads you've got at the system, because essentially, as you go up, if you have uh, a 64 byte um, array, and though each of those 64 bytes is its own thread trying to write to it, then you're going to generate some serious contention on the memory traffic. Uh, and so you could find, you know, it could be an order of magnitude or even two orders of magnitude difference in there. So uh, we talked about the memory structure, some of the ideas about that, but let's now go a little bit deeper and talk into how the core actually works. And the Intel cores and most cores are generally split into what's called a front end and a back end. And the front end's job is to be able to read instructions from the memory and translate those into micro operations or UOPS because sometimes the U is easier to type than me on the keyboard and serve them to the back end where the back end actually does the work. If we look inside the front end, there's a number of different stages that a an instruction will go through. And you might have heard of application uh, of processors having a pipeline for being able to process things. And these are some of the steps in that pipeline. So when you're passing some uh, random bytes in from memory, what will happen is they'll go through different stages. There'll be a pre-decode which says, okay, given this stream of data, I think the instructions end here, here, and here. And the reason why we do this with Intel is because they have a variable instruction length as opposed to RISC, which has a fixed instruction length. It will then decode each of those things into instructions, optionally with some trailers that it needs to fix in the next time around. And then those will be passed into the UOP decoders. So in this case, if we focus on this increment instruction, which says increment the single byte that's located at this memory address, although it's a single Intel instruction, it actually means that we have to load something from memory, we have to increment it, and then we have to write that back again. And so that will get expanded into three micro ops. And those three micro ops will be sent to the back end. Now, there's some other things that the front end will do as well. In particular, we've got a loop decoder and a UOP cache. What will happen if you're doing loops in a program is if you're jumping to the same location each time, then it will give you the same parsed values back from the UOPS rather than having to go through all of those stages. And so when people talk about the pipeline depth of an application, they say, uh, in this particular case, Intel's have a pipeline depth of between 14 and 19 uh, steps. And this cache is a way of eliminating some of those pipeline stages. There's also something called a branch predictor. And what the branch predictor's job is, is to figure out where the instructions are actually coming from. So are you doing a jump? Is there something that's coming up? Do you need to move somewhere else? And if you jump to a different place in memory, you then need to be able to start reading instructions from somewhere else instead, and you can end up with something called a pipeline bubble. So let's just have a quick look at the branch predictor. Branch predictors are very advanced uh, algorithms implemented in silicon to be able to guess where you are going for next time, wh wh what's happening with the flow of the program. And most branch predictors in CPUs these days are between 95 and say 98% correct. So if we have something where we're comparing a value to 42, uh, if it's true, then continue on. If it's not, then jump somewhere else in the program. Um, it learns by watching what your program does. So the first time you go through a loop, it's kind of random as to whether or not the branch predictor will work as expected. But if you're looping over tens, hundreds, or thousands of elements in a data structure, the loop will notice that the program is taking the same jumps each time and therefore learn to where you should be going for next time. What it means is that if you have data that's very ordered or you have phases within your program, so say if you have 
sorted numbers and you're iterating through them and you're trying to partition them into things that are less than 100 and things that are greater than 100 for example if you've sorted your algorithm you've sorted your data beforehand there's going to be a prefix of data there's less than 100 that goes in the one bucket and then the suffix that's above 100 that goes in a different bucket and the branch predictor will be able to learn that pattern and be able to show you something uh, be able to effectively optimize the guesses of where the program is going to go if, on the other hand, your data is random and essentially when a new data item comes in, it's essentially random as to whether it goes into one bucket or the other, then the branch predictor is not really going to be able to help you and just not do any better than 50% of the time guessing. The thing about branch prediction is if you get the branch prediction right, then the instructions are queued up and waiting to go on the next cycle. If you get the guess wrong, you have to throw away the stuff that's in the pipeline beforehand and then you get to start processing the instructions again. And this is one of the things that hyperthreading uses to be able to effectively run two virtual threads on your processor. If you've got two hyperthreads and you've got a pipeline stool, there's a bubble that's come in, you can then switch to the other stream of work and start consuming that data. And by doing that very quickly, it makes it look like there's two sets of threads that are running. Something related to branch prediction, but slightly different, is the branch target predictor. So that says where we're going. Now, if you're just jumping to a specific known location or to the start of the loop, that job is done. It doesn't really take a great deal of genius to figure out where it's going now. But you don't always jump to a particular hard-coded location. Sometimes you jump to a location that is dependent upon the value of a register at a particular time. In the case of jumping to a method implementation in Java, for example, you first need to get hold of the class, find out where the class V table is, then jump to the method inside there. So actually calling a method in Java is going to most of the time not work terribly well with a branch target predictor because it's not always going to be able to know where to go to in that particular example. And one of the benefits of inlining as an optimization is that you avoid the whole concept of a jump and therefore because you're avoiding the jump you avoid these pipelines that come inside there. So the branch target predictor and the branch target predictor live within the front end of the core and they are there to decide where the next set of instructions are coming from. However, once you finish with that, you end up with the core passing, the front end part of the core passing it to the back end. And the back end is really where the work's done inside here. What happens is you opt center in order, but once they get in, they're allocated and, and, um, uh, and set up appropriately, there is a race to be able to execute these micro ops as fast as possible. And each micro op has a set of dependencies that need to be met first of all but if you're incrementing for example two entirely independent registers then those can run at their own time the other thing is when you step into the back end the register names don't really mean anything anymore so in the x86 instruction set architecture we have registers like eax rax ebx and so on once you put those registers inside the back end, they get renamed. So in this case, we've got R99 as being the register entry inside. This means that the program can have lots of values of EAX at any one time assigned to different registers in the register file, and therefore be able to uh, keep moving forwards in execution, even if some of the prior execution has been delayed. Once the data's come in, these then get allocated to what are called ports. And so ports are these numbers around the scheduler at the bottom. Each port can handle certain types of operations for either integer or floating point units. And so in this case, for, for incrementing a value, it could be sent across to any of the ports in um, a Skylake system, um, except the port six. So port six, um, uh, in this case, they, they all have ALU support. So ALU is the arithmetic logic unit, which is going to be able to deal with increments. If you're dealing with, say, a divide or a multiply of an integral number, those would only be able to be allocated to port one or to port five in this particular case. And if you're dealing with floating point units, then they can only run on zero, one, or five. The other thing is, if you're working on 256-bit operations, then they can be run across any of the ports. But if you're dealing with 512-bit operations, because you're using AVX 512, for example, um, then you can run 512-bit operations on port 5, but you have to combine port 0 and 1 to do a 512-bit operation inside there. Now, this is all transparent to you as a programmer. You don't get to say where these go or what happens. But inside the back-end scheduler, there are these ports that have particular properties 
and instructions of a particular type can run on a subset of those ports. And so you end up with what's called port contention. If you have a program that's just doing a bunch of additions, they can run on any port, and so you can potentially run four operations at one time. However, if you're doing multiplies and you're on a Skylake system, then you'll only be able to do multiplies on port one, for example. So we've done our increment uh, to the uh, program. First of all, what happens is we're reading the location of 4D2, so that goes into a load buffer. Maybe we get back 2A from that, and that gets written into the register file. Once the data dependency for the increment has happened, it can then execute. And so we do an increment to be able to update that register file for 2B. And then we can then do the write back, which then gets put into the store buffer, sent down the caches, and come back again. The point about this is that in order to get the best execution speed out of your processor, you need to be executing multiple UOPS in the back end at one time. And most of the time, this will happen for you. But there's a concept of instructions per cycle that you can measure by using tools like Perf. And what instructions per cycle will do is it will give you the idea of how efficiently you're using your processor for being able to execute things. And the reason why we need tools like Perf to be able to look at this is you can have a program that shows 100% CPU utilization, but only has an IPC of 0 0.5. So it's only executing, on average, half an instruction per cycle. And you can have exactly you can have a, another program running on exactly the same hardware, also showing 100% CPU utilization that's doing, say, four instructions per cycle. And the four instructions per cycle one will be in wall clock time much faster than the one that's only doing 0 0.5 instructions per cycle. So Perf, if you don't know about it, is a tool for being able to do performance process monitoring in Linux. It has a record option, which will allow you to trace the execution of either a process that you launched or a PID that you're attached to. And it will generate a perf data file, which you can then look at with perf report or perf annotate. There's also one called perf stat. And perf stat will tell you some of these program counters that you can use to find out how efficiently your program's actually running. Perf record is the thing that will run your program or connect to a program and find out how efficiently it's running and optionally generate stack traces from them. The stack traces are most of the time going to give you accurate data, but sometimes you'll find that the data is skewed. And that's because there's something called event skew. So when the processor wants to record an option, uh, record where you are, um, it has to then at some point later generate the stack trace of where that is. And the processor may have moved on and be executing a later instruction by that point. In most cases, it might be a line or two off in your, CP, in your source C code. But it could also be somewhere completely different if you've returned from a function at that point. And so by adding colon p for precise on the end of the record, the, the record that you're doing, or even more p's up to uh, three p's inside there, you can then reduce the skew that happens inside there. And the perf documentation tells you what the difference between these options are. But it's something like you are happy with some squid, but you're not. Uh, you're happy with some skew, but you're not too bothered what it is. Um, there can be skew, but you'd prefer not to be. There can't be any skew, uh, and so on. The other thing that Perf will do is it will record what your stack trace is using branches in the program. And there's different ways of pulling out branch data from a, pro a running program. One of the ways is if your program is compiled with without emitting frame pointer support, or there's a corresponding Java flag, which is to uh, enable frame buffer pointer or something like that. I'm sure Jim will be pasting it into the console shortly. Um, but if you have a program that doesn't have that support, Perf can be able to constitute the backtrace by looking at dwarf debug data that you might have compiled into your program. That's a slower way of doing it, but it will still give you the same uh, operations. But more recently, new Intel processors have something called last branch record. And last branch record will essentially take a history of where your program jumps and be able to use those as the direct stack frames that were actually used rather than just ones that are derived from the frame pointer itself. And that can be quite useful, particularly if you're doing tail call functions where you don't necessarily see that call inside the stack trace. And even newer processors have something called Intel Processor Trace. And Intel Processor Trace is much like LBR, but it can extract the data far faster and therefore with a lower overhead. And there's a couple of links on the bottom of this page that will tell you more about that. But PerfStat is the one that will tell you how your programs, how efficiently your program is running. So in this particular case, we're just base64 encoding a word, uh, which isn't a tremendously good example of a program under test, 
but it's just a way something that fits on a slide and anyone can easily be able to do. In this particular case, it says we've executed 1.2 million cycles. Of those 1.2 million cycles, approximately 800,000 of them were stalled. In other words, we're waiting for stuff to come back from the memory in this particular case. And as a result of which, we're only doing 0.7 instructions per cycle. And so 0.7 is pretty slow. Uh, I put a couple of thumbs up and thumbs down here. If you are dealing with less than one uh, for the value of the IPC, then there's probably some performance that you're leaving on the table. Um, it says if you're doing above four, then you're doing really quite well. Uh, someone pointed out to me afterwards when I did this slide that actually really good programs typically have an IPC of about two and a half. So if you can't get to the four, don't worry about it. But generally speaking, less than one is bad. And the higher you get, the better it will be. Um, it's also dependent on how many UOPS the processor can run at one time. And in Ice Lake, you can dispatch more UOPS per cycle than in Skylake. So it may be that the IPC for Ice Lake systems can nudge higher towards five in that example. Um, the last thing on the bottom of this slide it tells you how many branches and branch misses you've done. Um, generally speaking, you're not going to be able to change how many branch misses are uh, being used unless you can find a way of not branching in your code. So it may be that you can switch data manipulation operations. So instead of doing, you know, if it's negative, then flip it by one. Um, instead, using some sort of mathematical operation to bit mask out the uh, sign bit and then be able to XOR things together. That's, th there are mathematical ways that you can uh, often do calculations without needing to have such branches in place. But in this case, it's mispredicting about 5% of branches, which means that we're getting about 95% accuracy on a branch predictor, which is sort of where you'd expect programs to be able to be. And that's why it's in the kind of yellowy color rather than a red color. Um, these are stored with performance counters. So each Intel processor has a number of dedicated performance counters that it will give you for free, things like the number of instructions, the branches, the branch misses, and so on and as some programmable counters. So you can say, you know, how many cache misses have we done? Uh, what's the load like into the level one cache and so on. There's only a few of them, which means that if you want to be able to read multiple counters, you need to go into a multiplexing operation. So if you've got counter X and counter Y that you want to be able to read from, but there's only one counter available, well, you just read counter X for one microsecond, read counter Y for one microsecond, and then just ping backwards and forwards until you get a statistical overview of what those are like. Perf will have a list which you can run, you can show with perf list to see what performance counters exist on your system. And if your performance counter isn't listed in there, you can use a CPU mask to be able to say what it is. So under the covers, each performance counter that you use has a code that's associated with it to enable it. And Intel publish a set of optimization manuals and information that will tell you what those are. In order to find out where you need to spend time improving your program though, you can use something called the top-down microarchitecture analysis, which was created by Ahmed Yassin. And the top-down microarchitecture method, uh, analysis method is a way of saying, okay, let's partition our space into things that are front-end bound, so taking some time decoding instructions into micro-ops, back-end bound because you're waiting on memory or because you're waiting on uh, slots on the core itself, bad speculation because you're just getting the number of branches wrong, or retiring, which is the good case where your program's actually executing. And you can find this document, this picture, in the software optimization manual, which I've uh, listed at the bottom. Uh, but generally speaking, the tree just says, um, the decision tree for this method says, do we ever allocate a micro op? Uh, if we have allocated it, then it's come out of the front end, so uh, you need to be able to look at what's going on there. And if we don't allocate it, are we stalling on the back end or not? The stall will tell you whether it's back end or front end. Fortunately, instead of having to learn where all of the symbols and um, the, the names are for the performance counters of this, it's built into a couple of tools. One of them is PerfStat Topdown. What PerfStat Topdown will do is it will give you an overview of how your system is running as a whole. Um, if you try and run it, then it will say uh, you need to run it with dash A for all CPUs. And in this case, we are running a program called Sleep One, which we're not really measuring in the context of, but it just gives us a timed boundary for what the system looked like at that moment. And in this particular case, we can see socket zero, calls zero through five, are running with a combination of things, but most of them, uh, it seems, are either back end or front end bound. So the retiring column inside here shows that we are uh, best on core four, 
doing 35% useful work and then on the other ones between say 15 and 25% work. What that means is we're leaving performance on the table and if we can get that retiring up to you know 80 or 90% then we have got a better performing program in our system. But it also gives you an upper bound, right? We aren't going to get this program to run say five times faster. We might be able to get it to run two or three times faster but then we're going to be running up against the way that we're using our program um, and we might not be able to, to do things in a particularly efficient way. Um, but the problem with perfstat is it shows you what the total runtime of the whole system looks like. It doesn't show you something which is for a particular process. And so Andy Clean has written something called Toplev. And what Toplev would do is essentially orchestrates running perf records with a collection of flags to be able to see where the um, performance is being left on the table. And the first time you run, it will download some information from download01.org, which is Intel's um, site for processor information. And if you have a program that is repeatable, in other words, you can keep running it and get the same behavior, then you can use dash dash no multiplex. And what will happen then is instead of trying to measure everything in a multiplexing method, it will run it once using one combination of performance counters, then it will run it again with another combination of performance counters and so on until it gets a much more accurate picture of how your application fits together. So what you do is you run it with dash level one, dash L1, and it will give you the overview of whether you're back end or front end bound. So in this particular case, I've generated a random file, um, loading that random file and uh, then running base 64 on it. And because it's random, it's not gonna be predictable. It's not gonna follow the same patterns. We're not gonna see uh, learned behavior inside there. So at level one, it tells us helpfully that it's back end bound and so, we know that there's something to do with the way in which we're executing data. If you then change to dash L2, you run at level two, in this case, it's telling us it's core bound. And then at level three, it'll tell us that the port utilization is causing contention. So in other words, we've got a program, it's running, we're maybe doing a bunch of multipliers, multipliers can only run on one port inside our application. And therefore, that's where we're spending all of our time in the core. And if we could perhaps change the way the algorithm worked, maybe by using vector processing, maybe by using uh, some other uh, means instead of multiplications, we may be able to get a higher throughput for our particular application. The other thing that can get into processing uh, performance issues is the way that you lay the instructions out inside your program. So for example, this is the way that we would have a generic if else type statement. So we might have an if to say if there's an error, if it, there's no error, then we run the normal code. If there is an error, we run the ha error handling cleanup. And there's two ways that you can lay this out. You can either lay it out so that the error code follows automatically after the branch condition, or you can say the success code follows after the branch condition and then you jump somewhere else afterwards. And it really depends on the type of program you're doing and whether you expect there to be an error or not as to where things are going to go. The branch predictor will be able to learn the normal behavior however your program runs. But for example, if we have a cache line and the error code fits into the instruction cache line, but the normal code that you expect to run doesn't, then there's another cache jump that has to happen inside there. Whereas if you're doing a full through and it's in the same cache line, then it will allow you to run uh, easier. There is a built-in expect uh, command like uh, C uh, built in that will allow you to specify which one you think is likely and these built-in expects so in this case built in expect the error to be one we want to put that first or built in expect error zero we want the normal case um, the, the, the happy case to be considered in there. Um, the built-in expect used to emit a specific instruction it doesn't anymore but it does affect how the code is laid out and there may be on very micro architecture performance optimizations a benefit in looking at this. Certainly the Linux kernel uses built in expect in the form of likely or unlikely guards that it's hash defined to be able to lay out the kernel code more efficiently. The other thing that applies with instruction layout is where the loop stream detector is involved because you can have two pieces of code that do exactly the same thing, but it may just happen to be that one of the loops isn't lined up on a cache line appropriately. The loop stream detector works when the start of the loop is at the beginning of a cache line. And these two things don't look that different, but again, you can end up with a non-trivial performance difference, like a, um, a factor of two or three slower because the loop stream detector isn't able to work and so you're going through the additional pipeline stages of reparsing the instructions in the loop each time. If you're using Clang, there's an option to uh, 
to do this by having all aligning all non full through blocks to five that means just line them up on a, a cache line basis and have the function starting on five chances are if you haven't got a specific program that's going to take advantage of this then using these flags isn't going to give you any value but if you've got something that's using a lot of numerical loops uh, then it may be something that's worth trying but again you should measure if these changes are going to have any performance impact rather than just assuming that they will one thing that can really help with the loop with the way that you code layout is effectively defragging your code into hot and cold space if you run a program with a profile guided optimizer then it will actually spit out a specific section for hot code and cold code and um, the idea is that it puts all of the code that it's seen running into the hot section and therefore that hot section could be a much smaller space of the wider uh, application facebook has written a tool called bolt the binary optimization layout tool i think it stands for that effectively takes a pre-compiled binary runs it under a profiling to measure where the content goes and effectively defrags it into a hot and a cold space and the idea of doing this is that we're not changing any of the instructions particularly but what we're doing is we're condensing all of the hot code into a much smaller space within the application than would be if you were compiling the whole the system as a whole and they found that they've had a, a performance impact there's a Arxiv paper down at the bottom that you can read and they've got a github site that's providing some more information if you want to find out um, Facebook bolt works on a Program that has already been compiled uh, it effectively reverse engineers it uh, It does rewrite the content not only because it moves things around but also because it updates the jump locations for the individual elements inside there but um, it's a post processing step afterwards Google have recently launched something called LLVM Propeller. And LLVM Propeller is essentially a set of extensions to LLVM that have not yet been merged upstream, but they will do this on a compile level ahead of time rather than after the effect with uh, the Bolts approach. And so what they do is if you compile a program with F Propeller label, it will generate an executable and an additional uh, set of labels inside there or symbols. Then you can run perf record to generate perf data and then translate that into their perf propeller format with a tool that they've written and then recompile the program passing in a reference to that propeller file and what it will do is it will essentially do the same thing as bolt in terms of reorganizing code into hot space and cold space but it will do so based on a compile time option and therefore doesn't have to go through any of the um, intermediate parsing stages it also means that different uh, different steps within the LLVM optimizer can play so that you can uh, optimize this once it comes out. What this looks like is if you have a bunch of functions in your code and you're compiling something with Clang function sections, um, which has existed uh, already, what this will do is this will put each function in its own section instead of merging everything together into a code section. What Propeller does is essentially adds a new basic block sections, which allows you to generate each basic block in a particular section and then you can align those to be hot and cold things with a combination of the performance options inside there and then that will just mean that you have your hot part of the program running in one space and then the cold part of the program in a different space it should be noted that for both Facebook's and Google's approaches because it's using profile guided optimization you need to have something that's going to legitimately show your application under normal use with a particular performance profile because essentially you're optimizing it for one particular case and if it turns out that your application isn't using that then you would then have to go back again and uh, try again the last thing that I want to quickly mention here is the fact that you can often get more performance of your programs by switching what it is that it's actually doing. So if you're dealing with the base 64 example that we had before, maybe it's a good idea to put it into a vectorized option instead. And it may be that that vectorized option is something that happens for free because the compiler is good at auto vectorizing, or it may be that you write your algorithm specifically to work towards the optimizations. And uh, Daniel Lemire has written a JSON parser that uses SIMD operations to be able to parse JSON files. And it is a couple of times faster than the best on the market inside there. And this SIMD JSON library recently released a 0 0.3 where they had proved that they were able to get over two and a half gigabytes per second of JSON parsing. And this library is now uh, being made available in other languages as a native extension. So you may find that it's something that will come up inside there. Um, he's written several blog posts about it. There's the Argsif paper for the initial release inside there and the 
um, documentation. His website, I think, is lemonade.me, and he's got some write-ups in, inside there of how they do those things. But roughly speaking, it's by following the kind of low-level attention to where you can get more performance that we've been talking about in this presentation, moving over to cache-aligned and uh, memory-aligned data structures, being able to process multiple data elements per line in the case of using SIMD, um, being able to do branch fee. So there's a lot of branch fee arithmetic with inside the, the SIMD parser that you'd otherwise normally expect um, to use loops and branches for. So we talked about a whole bunch of things over the last hour. We talked about uh, memory. Generally, if you have cache-aligned or cache-aware data structures, they're going to fit into the runtime process much better than they would be otherwise. Uh, consider compressing data and um, be able to decompress on the fly as a means of being able to move less data across the different parts of the uh, application. Avoid ra random memory access. If you can nail down a regular memory pattern, then your memory prefetcher is going to be your friend. And consider using large pages, uh, transparent huge pages. If you use transparent huge pages, then use mAdvise and defer as the options for being able to set it up. And if you're writing a highly performant system across many gigabytes of memory, then perhaps look into LibNuma and other tools for being able to partition it. For the CPUs, consider each CPU as being its own network mesh cluster. So think about your fact you're moving data from one core to another, being able to process it. And in particular, branch speculation and TLB misses are costly. So if you can minimize branches and minimize memory misses, then you're going to be able to drive your program faster. And so using branch-free, lock-free algorithms are a good way of being able to speed up your code. But again, find where your hotspots are, find where you're suffering from performance and fix those things. And you can use top-lev, top-down um, micro-architectural analysis to be able to use that. And then finally, we talked about using vectorization and the various vector registers where you have. I've condensed the list of references that I use within this presentation onto this slide, and I've also got a bunch of links to various other blogs in there, and it's eight o'clock. So thank you very much, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions for people who might have them. Over to you, Jim. Yeah, cool. So we've got, we've got a couple of questions here, Alex. Um, the first one uh, is, is asking about uh, pinning and, and uh, asking what type of workloads do you think will benefit the most from thread and memory pinning? Um, yeah, it's a great question. So um, specifically for thread pinning, if you are dealing with any kind of batch processing or server side processing mechanism where you're dealing with lots of requests coming in, so either a push request or a pull request uh, for consuming things off a message queue, then there's a very common pattern of having one thread per core. So if you're using something like Node.js, um, you might have one thread, one node instance or, or one uh, JavaScript runtime happening per core. Um, I already mentioned with Netty, um, if you're running Netty, then it will set up one work thread per core as well. So there's generally a good idea of being able to use as many threads as you have cores in order to partition the workload, bearing in mind that, you know, maybe you want to keep a couple of CPUs aside for the kernel or the JVM or whatever else it may be. And in that case, thread pinning those worker threads can have a benefit um, because you then mean that the data that you process with those threads is local to that core's cache. Um, for organizing memory for the libnuma stuff, um, it, you see more benefits of it as the memory space grows larger and larger because programs are written with the, the assumption that everything's a von Neumann architecture and you know one memory access is exactly like another memory access. As you get to really big systems, that isn't really true and you know there can be almost an order of magnitude between accessing local memory versus memory far away we talked about uh, the local access to things on a wing but if you've got an eight socket system then and you need to be able to cross that to get out then the the, the fact that you're going to far memory rather than near memory is certainly something that's going to be optimized but if you're only running with a couple of gigabytes yeah it's probably not something that you really need to do if you're dealing with hundreds of gigabytes then yeah that's the kind of time you need to start looking at new motorware processing Cool. And the next question is, on an ARC64 CPU, can you pin the trusted execution environment on core zero to avoid the workload floating and impacting performance? Uh, that's a very good question uh, to which I don't have the answer to. Uh, I will see if I can find out and then uh, pass that back at a later stage. Cool. Thanks, Alex. And then the next question is around uh, non-uniform memory access. Uh, so the whole set of affinity problems that it brings used to mean huge servers and domains and scientific application simulations. Nowadays, it's starting to find itself uh, find its way into retail hardware, 
uh, enthusiast level AMD hardware. Um, and given the above context, there are two questions. Uh, how much of an impact do you think that non-uniform memory access will have on everyday software? And in your opinion, will the burden of utilizing the hardware the right way mostly leak to end developers, or do you feel compilers and interpreters will become smarter and somewhat shield us from the extra complexities? Oh, wow. What a combination of questions. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the going backwards, I think, um, the happy compiler phase or the intelligent compiler phase, um, I think there are different opinions in the industry, um, but I would say that hardware has been tending to advance faster than the compilers have. And in particular, if you look at what happened with um, Itanium, uh, they, was, they designed a very clever architecture that the compilers had to be written in such a way to get the best performance out of it. And it turned out that it was very difficult to write compilers to be able to get the best advantage out of it as well. Um, I mean, compilers do great things, but a lot of compiler minutiae, certainly in the C world, tends to argue about what's undefined behavior and how they can, uh, how they can optimize things in a way that they can prove to be uh, no longer there. And of course, the fastest code is the code that doesn't actually run at all. Um, and I think those are more common than taking advantage of the, um, if you like, the, the tips uh, for being able to lay, lay things out. Um, I certainly think it's going to be the case that over the next decade, I, and you know, to be honest, if, if, if I'd have given this talk 10 years ago, we'd be saying, hey, the multi-core revolution is nearby. Um, these days, my phone has got um, multiple cores running on it. Um, and we've seen innovations like having small cores and large cores so that you can, uh, you, you can gate the power that gets uh, run on a system. But we're, we're seeing more and more of uh, processing moving to a multi-core environment. What I think we'll probably end up seeing is uh, a hybrid model where GPUs and FGPAs are starting to come in play. Uh, and that's actually where a lot of the high-performance computing is, is ending up at the moment. There, there was a good talk on uh, QCon about um, uh, JVM that exposed the ability to offload uh, GPU calculations. So you would write code in Java and then it would um, translate it into uh, the GPU code, which could then run on multiple different GPUs or indeed being compiled out of FGPA, FPGA. And I'm sure Jim is fervently searching for that link to paste in, in the uh, line because I can't remember it. But, but I think we're going to see those sorts of things. And I can certainly see those coming more into mainstream because everyone's desktop PCs has got GPUs in them. Um, and we'll start to see more and more servers having the ability, if not actually the implementation, to have GPUs stuck inside them for the purposes of uh, processing a lot more um, effort inside there. Um, and then I think the final part of that question was, you know, do we think that these things are going to leak down into application code? I think it's going to be difficult for it to leak down into C as a language, simply because C as a language is really based on this premise of there being a uh, von Neumann architecture, and you can just you can just access any part of the memory at any time. I think what you might see are things like uh, Go programs with the way that you can set up and deal with uh, multiple uh, event streams and um, Go routines. And they may be able to take advantage of being able to use uh, different layouts of memory. Um, it's certainly the case that some JVMs had a NUMA support inside that, although I seem to recall the NUMA support was something that was, uh, th there was a specific flag to turn on and off NUMA support for, for some of the garbage collectors. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if there would be an advantage to having some programs that uh, run with NUMA support enabled. What I actually think is probably going to happen in the next five years, for example, is that VMs are going to be built to partition your application space into different groups. And having really beefy servers just means that you can run more VMs. And so each VM is going to be a sub NUMA cluster for being able to do its own thing and effectively pretend that a large system with you know, 250 cores on it is actually um, 100 VMs on there, each of which only have two and a half cores each. So I think I answered all of them. If not, then please come back to me. <laughs> Well, uh, there are three more questions, Alex, if you have time. Um, sure. The talk was really good, but very Intel-based. Any thoughts or comments on differences with the AMD Zen architecture? Uh, yes, it was. 
as it were, unashamedly uh, Intel-based. I um, did. Uh, I hoped I, I described it as such. Um, AMD has certainly come back a lot uh, recently, and what I think we are seeing is there is you know real competition within the Intel x86 instruction set architecture space for being able to compete. And it's certainly true that a lot of the more recent AMD processors have had, for example, much larger level three caches um, than the corresponding Intel ones. And honestly, you know, you throw cache at a problem, you get more cache back, right? So I think the improved cache is always something that's going to make programs run faster. I think we will see the, the way that you've got more ports being added into the scheduler in the back end as being a way of increasing parallelization as well. And I think in some cases, AMD do have a bit of an advantage for some of their more recent processor designs over Intel's because the, the last Intel um, uh, Lake refresh sort of didn't really do as well as they thought and disappeared without a trace. Um, but the great thing is that they are working against each other. Um, I think if I may point out that that's maybe the wrong thing to look at because I don't think the issue is, you know, which of AMD and Intel are going to be the best x86, 64 architecture. I think the more interesting thing is to look at, say, what Amazon is doing with their Nitro um, runtimes and uh, what they're doing for, um, you know, wh where we're seeing the RISC-V architecture going. Um, so I think that there's a lot of interesting space in and around the processor and server delivery. Um, you know, that you, you've got new startups um, like John Masters' uh, startup um, that uh, that is looking at the, the way, a new EDA or something like that, I think it is. Um, and you've got Oxide Computer, which is Brian Cantrell's new system uh, coming online. There, there's a lot of interesting investigations being done in the processor and uh, computing space in general. And, you know, at the low end, you certainly got ARMS and uh, the RISC-V, you know, sci five um, type processors being rolled out. So there's a lot of innovation everywhere. But I mean, Intel servers, probably Intel based, sorry, I86 servers, uh, Intel based at the moment, but you know, expect to see Zen starting to make some um, headlines in there as well. Sorry, Zen, not Zen. What would you recommend running to analyze live runtime performance in a production live environment to measure latency? with respect to memory, CPU, and I.O.? Uh, so that's a great question. I mean, I think Perf is your friend uh, in terms of being able to get some of that data um, coming out of it, particularly if you've got something with Intel processor tracing enabled, so Intel PT. Um, there was a link to the LWN article that talked a little bit about it. Um, but it's certainly the case that you can get some fine-grained uh, processor logs for being able to um, speak, see what's happening actually at the branch level and the cache level. I think there's always a difference between how well your processors are executing versus how well your applications are executing. And how well your applications are executing is almost certainly a function of wider things than how fast it is. So the kinds of concepts and talks that we've been looking at here are really about how you can double the speed of your, your program. Um, or triple the speed of the program just by trying to avoid memory cache misses and so on. I think when you look at wider systems, it is about how well you can keep fed your application with data, or if you're using disks, how well the disk cache is doing things. So, so there's a whole bunch of systems architecture discussions, you know, if you like the bottom half of the pyramid that I talked about at the beginning of this presentation. And there are a lot of tools and a lot of systems that you can use to look at those uh, sorts of things. Um, I think if I was looking at it, I'd direct you towards you know, some of the Netflix engineering, um, the way that they uh, capture performance data with their systems and upload it to uh, central dashboards, which then get viewed with their, um, their, their dashboard, their Grafana architecture. Um, but having some sort of always on performance monitoring for being able to feed data into there is, is, is good. Um, if you're dealing specifically with JVMs that I know Richard Waborso and uh, co have got uh, an always on pro profiling data. And I don't think they had a presentation at QCon 20, London 2020, but I know that they did one in 2019. So um, there are different, th there are specific performance tools that you can use for performing latency in your application based on the application runtime that you may want to do instead of, of doing that 
Um, the final shout out I think I will do for performance monitoring and performance processing is something called BCC, which is the BPF tools compiler collection uh, and BPF tools. So BPF is a Linux runtime that sits in kernel for doing measurement and you can then aggregate data, you can then um, process it, summarize it, spit it out and then get that back into user space so that you can then do something with it. And there has been a lot of um, tools, a, a lot of books written about BPF and how it, it's going. Brian Cantrell is, has got a whole bunch of things. One of his, um, he's got a really big book on BPF tools um, that I don't have here. Uh, I think I have one on order. Um, uh, that's, I don't know if that's showing up, Linux observability with BPF. Um, there's a QR code that may even show up on here. Um, so I'll get the ISBN to Jim um, if uh, we, we don't have it on there. But BPF is really, so what it is, it's kind of like a JVM. It's a bytecode JVM like WASM, um, except it runs in kernel. So you can write these very sh short snippets that hit hook into Linux kernel event monitoring and be able to do some processing with that. And if what you're looking at is, you know, how long it takes to process a request by virtue of, you know, you start, you, you receive an IO request and then you send something back again, you can write a bunch of programs in BPF to be able to tell you that answer. I mean, effectively, it's the Linux version of Dtrace. Um, uh, I think Brian has actually said Dtrace done right, or, or if it's not Brian, then, um, oh, forgotten his name. Uh, the other guy who does a bunch of Dtrace stuff. That's annoying. Um, but BPF is, is the thing that is used by a lot of these tools at the low level to be able to generate data. And it's amazingly powerful. It, it's much more than you think it would happen to be. Um, so I suggest that's probably a good thing to uh, be able to look at if, if you want to. Is there well, anyone thanks. else? The final, the final question um, kind of goes a little bit more into the JVM ecosystem. So could you please elaborate thread pinning in the context of the JVM, considering number of GC and compiler threads will be spawned non-deterministically non or JVM dependent fashion? Um, was that memory pinning or thread pinning, sorry? Uh, thread pinning. Um, so yeah, in the case of um, thread pinning, um, I think Netty is a great example of something that's written in Java that really takes benefit of being able to have the threads running on a particular um, core because when you get requests that are coming in, um, they are processed locally. And although you can read and write to elements in the heap, actually, when you're running in a thread, all of your allocation happens in something called a uh, thread local buffer, which is also TLB, which is why. I had to pause there to try and remember it. Um, but that TLB is specific to that particular core, at least for that one of the, um, uh, that one of the, the generation. And if you pin that thread to the core and it's reading and writing that data, then you'll get much better cache locality for that particular core. Now, it's certainly true that once the GC cycle happens, that data is going to be punted into one of the survivor spaces, so you lose some of that uh, coherency but you'll still be able to get advantage of the JVM or the operating system more specifically, not being able to move data from one place to another um, for being able to uh, process it. So for, for threads, I think that's a kind of example of what it is. Now, you certainly end up with other threads stomping on your code as well, um, because the, uh, the, the uh, GCs are going to come in and start processing and cleaning your data. Um, but in some cases, you'll find that the GC thread runs on the same um, core that you've just been running on, and so we'll pick up and, and deal with the changes. And then the last thing is, if you're using one of the newer GC uh, implementations like ZGC, then each thread can participate in the cleanup of data that is in the wrong um, the wrong region. Um, and effectively help the GCs work out. So again, if you've got things that are local to that particular thread, then it may be advantageous if it's pinned onto a particular core. Cool. Okay, Thanks, is that Alex. all of the questions? Yeah, there was another question on arrays, um, uh, whether arrays uh, would need Valhalla to be kind of be able to take advantage of uh, sort of being executed like a vector or an array of primitives. Um, I think I answered that one uh, in the chat, though, that that would need to be, arrays of pointers won't take, be able to take advantage of this, and that's kind of one of the things that, that Java and Valhalla will, will, have, will have to address. 
it's probably one of the biggest performance issues that, that still exists within Java comparative to C, C++ today. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, if you look at something like the records that have just come out um, as a preview in Java 14, um, one of the advantages of records is that you don't then have an extra level of indirection and another perhaps cache miss for being able to load the data uh, from one place to another. Um, because instead of having lots of small objects that point to lots of different places, they will all be in one contiguous block of uh, the object. And so you will find that using records perhaps is more uh, memory um, uh, kind to the cache pressure than perhaps a field of objects are. But I think there's um, you know, swings around about that. The other thing is that there's nothing to stop you as a developer manually flattening an object. So if you have an address and it's got um, you know, five strings in it, for example, that then point to five different locations of off heap and then also their byte buffers as well. Um, if that was proven to be a bottleneck and that most people had really short addresses or something, then you could create a data structure that had a bunch of byte array, uh, byte array content inside there and then you just concatenated effectively the strings and used integers to find out where one started and one ended. And that's one of the things that uh, Eclipse Collections does particularly well because if you want to have an element, uh, an array list that only has one element inside it, it's actually easier to have a class that just has you know, object element inside it as an implementation detail. And there are a number of different data structures that implement it and probably the same is true of uh, Apache Collections and Guava as well. Um, whereby the implementation that you use is actually a function of how many elements that you are processing. And you may have specific lists, list of one, list of two, list of three, list of four, uh, and then list of many, list of more than that. Um, sort of one too many lots, as the Discworld reference might have it. Um, but you can get performance benefits if you imagine what a record would look like, and then you do the compression ahead of time for being able to um, do that um, processing before records are there. Cool. And then the final one was, does anyone else need to visit a pub to recuperate after digesting low-level CPU architecture details? I guess we can't really visit the pub right now, but um, <laughs> at least at least a virtual beverage is, is definitely required. Alex, that was a great presentation. I think I enjoyed it more the second time around. Um, I really appreciate you giving that to us this evening. Good stuff. Thanks a lot. And I'll make the slides available afterwards. If, um, or you can follow that to my link from the QCon one, which is pretty much the same content as this. Awesome. Okay. I've already posted that one on the other links as well. So thanks very much, Alex. Great. Thanks a lot. Bye.